Hey, I'm Richard Bauman. You may remember me from such episodes as Playing With Fire or How To Pour Bronze. Well, welcome to today's episode where we're going to attempt to put the wings and pour the wings of the angel, fettle it all together and finish it. Ready? What's up guys? Welcome to another episode of Studio Life and on today's episode we are going to attempt to pour the wings or the remaining wings of this angel. This piece has been with us for a few weeks now and I think it's about time he took flight out of here. And, uh, but we have got three of six sections poured. Oh my God! This is one of... Because these pieces are quite thin, right? Let me just give you a bit of context. The, um, the original one, as you can see, this was all carved out of wood, right? We took a mould of this one, and then we took a mould of the wings. Each wing was like an individual piece of plyboard, each feather, should I say. Now, it was, they're quite thin, really. I mean, look how thin they are. I feel like we could have maybe got two halves out of that and then welded it down here. I mean, it... But anyway, this is, um, this is a monster of a section. Over here, we've got the shells that we're going to be pouring today. Um, again, these are quite chunky, meaty shells. These are ceramic moulds. So, um, and I'll explain more in depth in another video. But before these are made, we make wax sculptures, as we saw in the first episode. Uh, or the second episode, and we covered the waxes in this ceramic. But you'd seen them in the yellow ceramic. This is the colour they turn when they get put in the de-waxing kiln, which is to the left of me. And um, a lot of heat gets put into there. The wax then disappears, and then they turn white. The carbon, everything's burnt away, and they are literally solid. So these, these are lovely ceramic moulds. This has had about nine to 10 dips, um, and it's going to be a 46 kilo pour. So this is one section. It is an absolute meat of a mold. Um, so um, I think the thing to do now is to patch up all of these slits that I made prior to de-waxing um, so that it allows pressure and gases to escape without causing any cracks or discrepancies in the actual shell. So the thing to do once the shells have come out of the mould is to go over and inspect them, look for any hairline cracks. If you've got any hairline cracks, then you can use less trusty stuff. It is fire cement and uh, it's absolutely amazing because once it dries or cures, it goes absolutely solid and it just patches up these holes, patches up any cracks that we may have. Uh, then they go back in the kiln, preheat, we'll whack the furnace on, and then um, we'll attempt to pour these. I'm gonna be honest with you all, this, this size shell is actually one of the biggest that I've poured and uh, I'm, I'm actually really intrigued to see how well my shell application has um, held out. So the proof will be in the pudding, as they say. But as you can see, I'm currently sat on all the work we poured this week. Cue time lapse. Um, but this is all the work that we poured. Was it this week or last week? What day are we on? Thursday, it was this week. Um, we had a, 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 a new guy start, Tom, amazing. Tom, if you're watching, and I'm sure you are, thumbs up, great work. Um, he helped me pour all of this, and this was an absolute belter of a day, and uh, we, all we need to do now is, is get through it. But look, this is one of my, one of my woodcocks that we, um, that we cast, and I sculpted in, during our first lockdown. I went for a stage of just sculpting all these lovely 
British birds. Um, and we've got some of, um, we've got the radishes here. We've got Charlie Elliott's robin there. Uh, we've got a lovely stingray here. Um, and I, yeah, we're trying to find my kingfishers, but I can't see them. Um, but yeah, so they all went well. So hopefully these will go well. And, um, but yeah, well, we'll just have to wait and see. Oh, I'm a, I'm attached. <laughs> Get off me. Kiln time, kiln, open. And then we're gonna just put these three shells in because we're only gonna do one at a time. I wanna try and get, because like I say, they're about 46 kilos each. So the pot only really takes about 55 kilos. And I don't wanna overfill it. So I'm going to just do one at a time and see if, uh, see where that gets me. Because hopefully they pour, they don't crack, they don't explode, because I really don't want to have a paddy. Um, and because uh, it is, it's just soul destroying, you know? You put weeks and weeks into this work. The guys do the wax work tremendously. You put all the time and effort into the shell work, and you just at least can work, you know? So trial and error. I've had shells that have exploded on me in the, tar in the past, and um, quite frankly, it is soul destroying, but it does make you learn and it does make you try not to do it again. Because uh, it does, it costs you time and money and uh, neither of which are fun. So, let's pop this in. As you can see, these are actually pretty good. I mean, I've looked around, I can't see any noticeable cracks. So I'm hoping the heat of the kiln that we've got has actually given an all round decent cure. And um, these are actually looking really quite nice so let's stick these in Oosh! and uh, that's going to be awkward getting out when it's really hot because you want this to be red in there glowing red and trying to manhandle that it's like playing an epic game of hot potato and it's a bit like a jigsaw puzzle. Always bend your knees. So again, this one looks good. No noticeable cracks. All round. All round good. All round good? I think you need to go back to school, Rich. All round good. There we go. That one in there. That one's all good. In he goes. Now, we'll shut this up and uh, that's in. Science! Gas on. Flame igniter. So these have got safety switches on them which is not good to me when I'm five foot tall. Um, oh. But they're there, just in case. But as I said in previous videos, just put one on for a minute, let the heat get in. Let the heat find its way out so that it's just got a lovely journey of heat going from top to bottom put too much energy in there, it blows back and puts the burners out and you're spunking gas everywhere, which isn't great. So we're just gonna put one burner on, get it nice and hot, and then we'll stick the second burner on, get them up to temperature. But for now, I'm gonna go stick the furnace on and get that puppy roaring. So, I've put some ingots in the fire, in the furnace, and I got some strap bits as well, which can benefit just going in there. It's not bad. I mean, it's, it, you know, you can use old bronze. Um, just make sure you have a mixture of old and new because the more you use it, the less pure it gets and it's just harder to patina and you get a load of like slag and bits in there that have just over time filtered into the metal. So it's good to have a mixture of old and new so that you get a nice flow and you're always keeping it fresh. And uh, yeah, so I'm just going to stick the furnace on now. Get some, uh, get some cardboard to go in. Just to take you through what setup we've got here. Feel like I'm in my power pose. 
Hey, uh, no, just to go through the sort of setup that we got here, um, this is just an extraction hood. Believe it or not, Sam fabricated this out of an old filing cabinet. Honestly, he's a, he's, he's a magic man. And uh, obviously you've got the flue up there which just takes the heat out. We've also got this sort of like mechanism, uh, this sort of door flap, if you like. And um, this here is just like a little, little door so when the furnace is on, the heat can then travel up and it doesn't sort of spunk out the side. But the reason for this is obviously for the hoist. So you can lift it up like so. Nifty bit of kit. Lift it up, wrap it round, and just hope that it doesn't, it doesn't fall on us. Wrap it round. Then the hoist comes along, as you've seen before. <laughs> oh. Down it goes. And it's able to be situated above the furnace. It can come down, grab your pot, safety off, which is this lever here. And then it can lift your pot out the furnace. And without that flap, this wouldn't be possible. So two birds, one stone. Uh, and all in all, I think it's a decent design, but like anything, you know, it can be improved. Uh, what would be really nice is I've seen, I've seen another foundry, Chicago Crucibles, amazing founder, top quality work. He's got a one-man system for a pot this size. Absolute madness, but yeah, big ups to him. Total respect for the guy. Um, if you haven't already, check him out on Instagram. Uh, yeah, he's just got an amazing, amazing setup and being able to pour with just himself with a pot this big, <laughs> mind blown. But anyway, it's always good to have a couple more people around just for the safety aspect. But yeah, this is our, this is our setup in a little bit more detail. Um, enough with the jibber jabber. Let's get this puppy on. Science! So Flo's just found, found a load of bunting. Maybe she's gonna decorate the place. Are you decorating? Oh, no, she's putting it away. She's a little shy. We'll get her, we'll get her soon when she's, um, not bunting, I guess. So, a little bit of flame in by where the gas outlet inlet. Flame that bad boy up. Turn on to fan. Gas on. Fan on. Gas in. We have power. So the other day when we poured, we had a bit left over and uh, we poured our own little ingot, which is quite cool. This is about five kilos. And these are great when obviously you need to top your crucible up a little bit. Just pop it in. But first, as you can see, look, you see that has been on the furnace for literally about 20 seconds and you see how wet that is. All the moisture's being drawn out of this. If you were to stick this straight into a hot pot of metal, well, you'd have an explosion on your hands. And we don't want explosions. So, apart from the angel that's being cast, Vera and Lucas are smashing out the mould for this big old tree. It's a big blossom tree that was originally made from driftwood, but he wants to make replicas so that he can then sell them at like a, um, 
at a mass rather than having to make in each individual tree out of driftwood every time and keeping up with orders, he's able to then cast them in a bronze resin, get them looking really lovely and bronzy. Um, but Vera and Lucas are making these lovely molds and these are of the actual trees and stuff. So um, Vera, what are you doing there? Now um, I'm carving some holes on, on the mold, on the rubber, and then apply the fiberglass over it. What it's going to allow is this, those holes are going to be filled. Um, so when, when everything is dried, this goes and fits perfectly on the mold and doesn't slide. So the fiberglass then, as Vera said, gets laid on top of this mold and before they put that, they brush it over with some white, white spirit? No, not white spirit, washing up liquid and water and they smooth the rubber off like so and then Vera's just cutting those holes out so that when they have uh, thick resin before they apply the fiberglass, they fill those holes and they act as registration lugs so that the jacket can sit and fit in exactly how it's meant to each and every time and you don't get any warped mouldings or castings. So, um, well done Vera, looking absolutely amazing. And Lucas in here, he is actually still mould making the tree. Um, and uh, Lucas, knock knock, we're coming in. Um, so Lucas is, uh, well, you tell him Lucas, what are you doing? So basically now I'm putting this shim, um, this clay card used as a shim just to split the case in four parts. So under here, we have the same thing, to split the rubber in two parts, but because this, we, we're probably gonna struggle to open the case up. Mm -hmm. So we just put the cards to open in like four parts. Yeah. If that makes sense. So what he's saying is there are locks in place. So the high point, for example, on this tree is down the center. Um, to be able to, the, the, the width at the bottom and the top, it'd be quite difficult to take the case off. So what he's doing, he's just dividing the line where the case will meet each other and actually you'd be able to take the jacket off with ease and not have any problems trying to take it off because once you've got that large circumference area, getting the jacket off in one piece is quite difficult. Crack and work, buddy. So, back to the angel. I'm gonna have to get you a, um, your very own dressing room, aren't I? Huh? Well, isn't that what all superstars get when they're acting? Huh? That's when you have to get your own, get your own dressing room. So now we've got the kiln on, we've got the furnace on. Thing to do now is to prep the other bits of the wings that we've already poured so that when they're poured, we have less prep work to do. Uh, I'm gonna wire brush it all back, get them nice and clean, and then we're just gonna get them ready for assembly um, actually, quickly, let's just explain over here. These wings, so the wings are gonna be stupidly heavy, okay? So you've got this circumference or this air surface area, which is essentially gonna be what the wings are welded onto. The sheer weight of those wings on this surface area, I think might be a little bit too much just for a straightforward weld. So what I'm thinking is, that we grind this out, we get some stainless steel box section, and then we cut a section out in the wing, we weld a box section into this opening of the shoulder, and then we'll weld that inside the wing, so it's got almost like a, a big sort of industrial pin, if you like, and the wings are actually more stable than if you were to just weld it on and hope for the best. Because the last thing you want is for us to be in situ, and it, you know, come off or it, it will seriously injure someone. So we don't want that. So I think that's my thought process. We're just gonna weld and uh, grind it out and pin it. So here's what we prepped and poured the other day. These are literally sections of the, uh, of the wings. And as you can see, they are really thin. So getting these hollow would have been impossible uh, unless you're some sort of mastermind and uh, even then, I think you'd have a problem. Um, so, I'm just going to roughly finish these off. This one's fresh. It's still got the cup attached to it. It's still got its vents attached to it. And it's still got its gates. Um, so, my job now is to cut all these off, clean the wing back, and get it all prepped for application onto the Angel. <laughs>
science. All the uh, runners and risers off. As you can see, it still looks a bit dirty and still got some shell in there. So my job now is to wire brush the worst of it off. And then I'm just gonna go around with a hammer and chisel and I'm just gonna sort of bash some of the hard to reach places. All that shell and all the nasty bits. As you can see, we've got a bit of a hole there, uh, but that can be welded up. And uh, this is, I feel like what happened is when we poured our bronze in, and then it obviously shrank and the, the bronze drew in. There just wasn't enough bronze poured into the cup to then obviously fill that. And I feel like it's just shrunk back. Um, and then we're left with a little bit of a discrepancy. But part of our job is to sort of remedy these problems and to try and fill that up, grind it back and put the textures back into the surface as if it never happened.